Good day everyone! I would like to welcome all of our viewers watching online here in the Philippines and worldwide. This is the Public Sector Productivity Webisodes. My name is Gerard Calambro and I will be your host for today. To start, let us give a warm shout out to some of our attendees. I can see we are joined today by agencies such as the Department of Science and Technology, the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency, the National and Kidney and Transplant Institute, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, the Department of Education, the Lung Center of the Philippines, the Office of the Ombudsman, the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation, and our friends from the private sector, namely the e-business education research. Good afternoon, and to the ones I haven't mentioned, thank you for joining us today and welcome to this episode. On our webinar yesterday, we have learned that to be able to achieve lean management in the public sector, we should do the following processes first. One, perform the eight waste analysis. Second, create your value stream maps. Third, do root cause analysis. And lastly, formulate solutions and prioritizations of your projects and activities. On today's webinar session, we will be tackling improving public sector through total quality management and business excellence. With that being said, it is my pleasure to introduce to you today's expert. Our speaker is a certified ISO 9001 Quality Management System Lead Auditor by two of Rhineland in Cologne, Germany, and the International Register of Certified Auditors or IRCA in London, United Kingdom. He is skilled with a multitude of ISO standards. Furthermore, he is a licensed professional teacher and holds national certificates in mechatronics consumer electronics and computer services, and a certified specialist in the Internal Quality Assurance or IQA in higher education by the UNESCO based in Paris, France. He works as the Director of Quality Assurance at the Technological University of the Philippines, where he has successfully delivered ISO 9001 2015 QMS certification for the more than 119-year-old TUP main campus in less than one year. Recently, he has been designated as the director of the University Research and Development Services, where he is leading a passionate team to initiate programs and projects that aim to improve the scholarship and creative activities in TUP. Externally, he serves as a management consultant of the Development Academy of the Philippines wherein he successfully assisted the establishment of QMS to the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, the Philippine National Police National Headquarters, the Cultural Center of the Philippines, the Philippine Commission on Women, the Provincial Government of Sorsogon, the Quezon City Police District, Philippine State University, Intramuros Administration, Marikina Polytechnic State College, and other national government agencies. He is also a member of the Fairness Opinion Board of the Department of Science and Technology Calabarzon Region, wherein he is tasked to evaluate various research projects for commercialization purposes under the Provincials of Republic Act 10055 or the Philippine Technology Transfer Act of 2009. Let us all welcome Dr. Ralph Sherwin A. Corpus. Good afternoon, Dr. Ralph. The floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon, Sir Gerard, and to everyone from the DAP. Okay, so for today, we're going to discuss about how do we improve public sector productivity using Total Quality Management, and Business Excellence Frameworks. I am Ralph. I'll be sharing to you some of the best practices and some of the learnings that we had in TQM and related frameworks on how we'd be able to use them in our respective agency. For today, basically, we'll be talking about the needs and challenges in the public sector. Along with that, we'll be talking about Total Quality Management. In the third uh, part, we'll be talking about Business Excellence understanding the needs and challenges in the public sector. Majority of us are working in the public sector and you would see these familiar scenarios. These are pre-pandemic situations. I got this from the internet, just at least sharing with you. 
what is actually happening before the pandemic. So you will see here long queues on various agencies that we have. I think this one is applying for some licensure uh, renewal in one of the malls in the country. So you see this is a familiar site prior to pandemic. And these are also some of the common sites whenever they go through registration and say they would like to apply for registrations on for election. So they would like to become a registered voter. So these are common sites, common uh, scenarios that we see. Then this one is applying for loans and our government agencies. They would like to claim some benefits. So you see these familiar sites prior to pandemic. You will see the common denominator is that they jump up in public places as much as we would like to help them. But there are also we have some a lot of constraints you now that we have to overcome. Now this one is during pandemic, so I think this one is claiming for ayuda. So there are also issues about distribution, claiming that uh, they didn't get enough uh, ayuda. So I got this from the internet, and you see these are also some of the issues that we are facing right now in the public sector. Of course, we're not perfect, no. But at the end of the day, we have to realize what are these issues, and then we have to you know, work together and find solutions to this. How to manage the challenges, raise the productivity levels, and meet the needs of the public. So we have this commitment we have sworn in when we assume our office or our designations or our promotion that we will do our best to deliver quality and good public service. But today, we'll, I'll be sharing to you some of the techniques and frameworks being used by various experts and various successful organizations on how do they deliver quality service, particularly in the public sector. So we first have to be aware about the needs. Now, these are the pressing needs that we have to address, no? find remedies with in the government sector. Year in, year out, every day, no? we, we have to be citizen focused. Uh, the reason why we have citizen charter is because we have to make sure that we meet the needs of our citizens or the public. So we need here to provide customized and transparent services for the people. So we've seen this, the common issues on long lines is because maybe there are a lot of reasons, no? maybe lack of manpower, maybe lack of resources or technologies to meet this high volume of requests. No, but at the end of the day, our mandate is to serve the people. So with that, we have to find solutions on how we'll be able to realize this mandate by optimizing our resources, whether in manpower, whether in resources, whether in decision makings and management systems and all that. Another need that we have to address in the public sector, of course, the procurement of new technologies. We are now in the fourth industrial revolution. We've been talking about AI, Internet of Things, robotics, a whole lot more, no? Uh, but right now in the government sector, we're still challenged about procurement of these technologies, including the competencies, how to acquire these technologies. So all of these are the issues and the needs that we have to address, no? So we are calling for investments on innovation and emerging technologies on how to be able to improve our services. Okay, despite pandemic, our, our life still has to move on. Thank you for all these online platforms, maraming free, which we can use. No, But at the end of the day, how to be able to serve the people, the public, using these technologies, it's all that matters. There's a need for us to establish a smart government. So when you say smart, they are interconnected to each other. People are like perceiving that if you go to one government agency, he or she is expecting to be served smoothly and seamlessly, particularly if he or she will be endorsed into one other agency. So these are expectations of the public that we need to address. With the investments on this innovation and infrastructures, we are looking forward on how to be able to integrate one agency to another. So if we are using or we have the best practices in a QMS or quality management in general, then we would be able to connect one another and we have the same best practice of, let's say, if one agency is like serving their clients for like approximately 30 minutes in a day, then that could also be the expectation for another agency. So benchmarking one another through connected systems will help our uh, how do we improve our delivery of service? Another expectation of our clientele is that we are one-stop shop. They have these high expectations that if they go to our agency, they can do all their transactions at once. So these are challenges that we have to like address in the government sector. We need to provide seamless connection among processes and governments toward one-stop shop services. I think I've seen some of the agencies where in this, they have this one-stop shop. In PNP, shout out to our friends in PNP, you know, they have this one-stop shop where all requests are processed into that area. And of course, other government agencies, they have this initiative so that the experience of our customers and citizens are addressed at one time, one time area, in a particular area, a particular scenario. Of course, we, we acknowledge that we lack resources. We acknowledge that we need to invest in infrastructures with some budget constraints. You no, know, one of the solutions that maybe we have to look forward to is we can link, you no, know, we have to improve our linkages maybe partnership with the private sector. We have the public-private partnerships funding a certain project and then later on will be turned over to the government. So we've seen that on 
let's say, tollways and other infrastructures. You could also explore opportunities on linkaging with the academe, with the HEIs, higher education institutions, with SUCs on how to be able to leverage our research and development capabilities. Maybe you would like to acquire more technical competence in emerging technologies, in research and other capacity building activities. So we can expand our linkages with them, the SUCs, the academe, other uh, non-government agencies, private sectors, you know, in such a way that we can collaborate one another and help one another uh, to deliver a better public service. Who cannot forget the effects, uh, the disruptions brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have seen we've struggled a lot financially, economically, and even our personal lives. Like right now, because of the protocol that we have to wear face masks, it's part of my job to comply. COVID-19 pandemic, we agree that this is something that's really challenging, uh, environmental constraint that we have right now. But our life has to move on. I'm still in the office to like provide better service for the public. And I hope you do the same in your respective agency. So despite all this turmoil, we consider this just as challenges. What we have sworn in the moment that we accepted our job or maybe our designations, we sworn in that we have to serve the public with good and quality service, with utmost transparency and professionalism. So all of these are the needs that we have to address. Unfortunately, there are challenges in the public sector. One dimension that has been described by this one as a reference by Mangahas, one of the research of Mangahas et al. She compared the nature of the public and the private sector. Why is it so hard to please the public you know, when in fact everything what's being done is free? In the perspective of the public sector, you know, in the mindset, let's say, of top management or the senior leaders or anyone who's part of the management, we know that our customers are, are the constituents, the citizens, the public per se. In the private sector, they care about markets because this is where they, they make profit. If you compare the two types of customers, they are profit-driven, so they are very specific into their market. Where in fact, public sector is like very wide. You have very wide types of customers. Any person is a constituent, so he or she is your customer. In short, we have so many customers in the public sector. And almost everyone in the, you know, if we have 100, 000, 100 million uh, population in the Philippines, then we expect that we have 100 million customers. Now, the output in our organizations, although we have institutionalized our own respective QMS, it was still not clear what kind of output do we produce. Are we into product or are we into service? Well, majority of us, of course, are into service, but some are also producing product. Actually, with my experience in installing QMS in various agencies, we have a hard time like establishing the 8.3, if you're familiar, the ISO 9001, 8.3 design and development process. Is it applicable in the public sector? With that context, it's quite hard to define. Is it applicable for service? It's a different story. I mean, what I'm saying is like, if we cannot define our output per se, then it would be hard for us to like, deliver this kind of output. No? So it's not clear in a government agency if we are more into product or service, although we are inclined into service, but some are more into product. Product in a sense of policy, maybe in a form of national plan or national agenda, or maybe in a form of, let's say, actual product. Let's say they develop the ASTI, they produce high or advanced technologies for the use of the industry or for the use of the academe. No? So they produce this kind of product. Our colleagues in the agriculture sector, they come up with some research and develop certain genetically modified fruit or vegetables. So basically it's our product. But in general, no? in general perspective, the definition of service versus the output as in the context of output, well, in the private sector, of course, it's definitely uh, defined. So they define it as a product, per se, it's tangible, and they define it as a service, it's tangible. In our case, it's a variable. Now, in terms of process, when we go through the process, as I mentioned, every customer that we have is unique. Every individual is our customer in the public sector. So we expect the process is more complex. Unfortunately, although it's very complex, no, it's less flexible because we are bound with certain regulations. So it's not as easy to like modify a certain procedure because you just wanted to. You have to go through a certain process because it's a form of standard procedure or policy that has to go through public forum or public fora. So in short, process is very complicated, yet it's not easy to modify them. Now, in the private sector, it's structured, definitely, because they are bound to that profit mindset. So these procedures or processes should be aligned with that profit maximization. And there should be more rewards in that effect. In terms of purpose, no, the public sector, we provide public service. At the end of the day, it's still the public that we, we serve. It's a private sector, it's the profit. And I think we all agree that whenever you hear you make profit in the public, it's more of like corruption or graft. So it's a no-no no to do that, to make profit in the public sector. 
well in the private sector, they more into profit. So with that, they do all necessary remedies or solutions, improve their processes because they drive profit. They ensure whatever they do and they enhance the customer's satisfaction to make sure that they make profit. In goals, we know there are political challenges that we that we face, the cultural backgrounds. Our goals in our agencies are quite problematic because they are driven by these factors, political, environmental, social, economical. So the moment that change in management, it all then it goes through with the plan or the policy or the goals. So all of these are challenging. The moment that there's a new president or a new uh, you know, set of officials, the, the, current, the current policies in place or procedures may be changed later on and it creates confusion or ambiguity among us. Well, in the private sector, it's well-defined, no? The moment that uh, certain officials will resign, then there is, they have this change management plan, no? Everything is well-documented. There's a formal turnover and all that. At the end of the day, the new or the old leaders, they all look forward for profit maximization. So you have the same agenda. And the last but not the least, as in political and professional communities, no? They're very powerful in the public sector, no? They have a very significant impact on our decision makings as senior leaders in government agencies. So they can totally establish a new system and eventually replace it with a new system. Well, in the private sector, their environment are more into satisfying the industries, working collaboratively with their suppliers. And at the end of the day, they all make profit. As we have characterized in the public sector, we could say that it's very challenging. It's not an easy task to manage the public sector, whether they belong to the top management, the middle management, or being just a frontline employee. You know, it's really hard to please the public uh, if we work into the government. The challenges, no, as I have to look them further, according to Mangahas, the security is one of the challenges that we need to address. Second is the resistance to change. And the third one is a very complex environment. So security of tenure. I think we're all familiar that whenever you get into the government and you're a permanent employee, you cannot be removed without due process. So with this kind of connotation in mind, so we have the tendency, I well, don't say that majority, but some are like taking into this consideration that I cannot be removed easily. So with that, I have the tendency to relax and be complacent on my job. Unfortunately, some or just few of those are doing that. But it is basically a challenge in the government sector because they have this thinking that they are secured and they don't get kick off from their designations or with their job, you no, know, because they're permanent, then some of them, you know, they don't perform in some agencies. But these are what we are really looking forward to and how we'll be able to invive this kind of culture and come up with a more positive and performing culture so we could help our agencies. We've seen challenges in achieving their PBBs, you no know, performance based bonus. Sino po sa inyo na ang consistent na nakakuha ng PBB? May I know. May I know also who are consistently submitting their IPCR, their OPCRs, and they get like a very high grade, they get bonus. These are like some of the challenges that we have in the government sector. Some are just like saying that, oh, I'm not going to fill up my IPCR because I didn't get PBB. No, but they did not know unless they know, they know that it's actually a requirement by the civil service. So all of these are some of the issues no, that we have to address. The security of tenure is another perspective. So those who are into the senior management or senior leaders, they have to take a look into this. Maybe we have to realign security of tenure with performance, no? And later on, we can use this as evidence or as basis for promotion, maybe as basis for reassignment, or maybe as basis for future managerial decisions. Another challenge that we have to address, the resistance to change. So since we are permanent in the government sector, we assign to this a permanent task. So we have this and then we, we feel that we are secured. So chances are implementing new policies or new frameworks or models and initiatives to reform the government is not easy because there is that culture of resistance. There are some, they resist the change because it will require them to exert lots of efforts. So they're quite more hesitant to change us and it will take longer for reforms to be realized. So these are challenges if we are the change makers in our own respective organizations. And the last but not the least, a very complex environment. You know, I mentioned earlier, political activities, they may create conflict. So we have to be very careful as well whenever we implement certain policies and new systems to improve the public sector because of this very diverse cultural background and political environment that we have is very powerful.
But of course, at the end of the day, if we're doing our job, we're being transparent, we're being honest, and we have this integrity to serve the public, I think you can never go wrong with that. These are basically the needs and challenges in the government sector that we have to address. And what are the opportunities? One proposed solution is the total quality management. PQM, basically, it's been here for quite some time already, no? um, but it's, maybe we could go back and uh, you know, discuss a little bit more about this and an awareness will, will make a difference on how we're able to contribute to our respective organizations. So may I request everyone, if you're using your devices, whether you are in laptop or cell phones, I just want to know how do you define quality? Whatever experience you had, subsectors in the academe or into the agriculture or into the other agencies, how do you define quality? So I see here, standard, DAP, good, thank you. Something that's beneficial. So again, I'm also reading some of your comments here. So this is a word cloud that's auto-generating based on your responses. So the bigger the word is, the more responses have been recognized. So in this case, that's it. We have 773 or 798. We see here excellence. We see here quality. We have value, you know, client satisfaction. What else? Condition, high standard, effectiveness, efficient consistency, perfection, good performance. Those are like the keywords that you have. And those definitions are valid. Thank you for sharing. Basically, you're right. We define quality in the various perspectives. Some are saying it's more an excellence because uh, there's a transcendence approach. Way back, Greek philosophers and during that time, their civilization, they define quality as something that's excellent. It's perfection. So maybe in the academe, they define quality as excellence. So if you have higher degree or PhD or if you have a lot of research, then you are an excellent or a quality professor or a faculty. But they, they define its conformity. So this one is on standards. So standard, basically you set the minimum requirements. These are the requirements of regulatory body, statutory requirements, regulations, babatas, kernel policies that you have, the contract that you have with your customers, or maybe your internal policy, and the international standards. So these are basically conformity. Now, usually, like m and has a manufacturing approach because they're very strict with their suppliers and they have to make sure that what they're being supplied are quality products and inputs. Another perspective is precision. So this one is more onto the production side, production-based approach, wherein they're very specific on the features. So if you say that this particular chip should have a heat capacity of this, so they're very precise with their measurement. So precision is a definition of quality for those into the manufacturing and product development companies or organizations. Another is fitness for purpose. So this one is for the user-based approach. No, so perspective ng uh, users, they could say that you were able to realize your vision and mission and your objectives. So you are fit for purpose. No, so you're realizing your purpose. Your mandate has been realized. You can validate this through customer surveys. And the last but not the least, this one is very common for every one of us. No, particularly the public. If we're buying something from Shopee, from Lazada, you always look for the Sulit. You've gone through with those highest ratings and because we look for value for money, we have to make sure that whatever we pay for can be compensated by the quality or what do we expect from that product or service that we are availing. So that's value for money. So all of these definitions basically are correct now and they are varied depending on your environment, depending on your work or depending on your experience. So all of these are valid definitions of quality. Going back to the memory lane when we were quite confused and quite varied with our definition, the industries, no, uh, they defined it according to ISO 8402. This is the first standard that was uh, crafted to address, you know, different interpretations about quality. So during that time in 1994, when quality management was still a proliferating philosophy, they defined this as the totality of characteristics of an entity, you know, whether you're an organization, whether you're a process, that bear in its ability to satisfy the stated and implied needs of your customers or conformance to requirements and degree of excellence. So here you will see the word conformity or conformance and the keyword degree of excellence. The so degree of excellence in the sense that you have to specify is this poor? Is it excellent? Is it very good? No, so they have this degree of excellence. So that was way back 1994. In ISO 9000 2015, I think majority of you are ISO certified. So if you go back with the fundamentals and vocabulary, quality is defined as degree into which inherent characteristics, meaning your internal characteristics, you define it internally, 
of an object to fulfill the requirement. So that object, whatever evidence that you have, whether it's a form of document, whether it's a form of implementation, it fulfills the requirement. Statutory, regulatory, customer, internal policies, international standards. So here, there's now definition, whether it can be categorized as poor, good as excellent. So somehow it's quite relatable with the ISO 8402. The ISO 9000 is the latest dictionary being used in defining quality. Before we met the ISO 9000 series, or we know it as ISO 9001, basically it has evolved from the industry, usually it originated in the private sector and eventually embraced in the public sector. Keywords that have came into action, uh, into practice by different advocates and philosophers and industry experts during that time. From 1900s to 1925, like going back down the memory lane, this was like the first industrial revolution. Uh, the focus of quality, you know, they are more into productivity and make profit, of course. No? I say that, that's, that's the time that there is still a booming industry in automobile, producing cars and factories and all that. Frederick Taylor, who is the proponent of scientific management, Max Weber, and Henry Fayol for the internal process model. No, They're more into writing objectives. As an organization, we have to write these objectives. We have to have these policies. We have these procedures. Unfortunately, during this time, they have this very minimal support for human resources. So that was like the downside, but they are into the profit maximization. So it was called the rational goal approach. So what was the keyword that have been identified? or establish here, they have this process model, they have the written objectives, policies, and procedures. So all of this, the call out the word quality control has been coined out at that time. No? Quality control is the common definition of quality during that time. And they are more into profit maximization. And they are less humanistic in their approach, unfortunately. In 1925 and 1950s, it has ignited the desire of everyone for equal fee, so everyone can fare squarely, whether they are female or male, regardless of their genders and cultural backgrounds. So they have asserted their rights. There's now the human relation approach. In 1925 to 1950s, you will see here activists asserting their rights for fair labor. So stock market uh, crashed in 1929 and the World War II has huge economic impact. What has proliferated during this time or more on organizational psychology? They focus on how do, how do they motivate the people because of the recession. The World War II impacts. How do you train them, how to educate them, and maintain the high morale of employees. During this time, quality assurance was institutionalized as a requirement no, for all organizations if they are more into quality. So from quality control, it became quality assurance. They have to assure that whatever has been produced, that have, what, have, what have been intended to be produced, have actually been produced based on established characteristics. So the keywords here during this area, they are more on building the competencies and the morale of the people because they believe that people are like the best assets of any organization. And then in 1951 and 1975, so here comes the open system approach. We're in, there is now the start of globalization. U.S. is the, the world market leader and then followed by Japan, who is consistently promoting or producing good quality products and even until now you see japan quality in product milano because they have invived this philosophy called total quality management although the proponent is an american but he established it in japan during that era and uh that's the time where an open competition has proliferated so nagkaroon ng rapid production of quality products from japan and u.s due to that stiff competition cats and can develop the model which allows the firm to interact with other firms so there's now collaboration with other from one organization to another, you know? and they're competing positively because they would like to, to produce quality products. And that stiff competition has ignited their desire for total quality management. So during this time, you no, know, Gareth Morgan has mentioned that for each organization to survive this time, they have to be very adaptable to changes. And in 1976 to 1990s, now it's called the new quality paradigm. So this time. The global uh, competition has evolved, no? it has become very fierce. There are issues on employment rate, very high unemployment. There are organizational downsizing. And here comes the re-emergence of the word quality. So it was uh, initiated by the auto industry, you know, by the Japanese and American and the European manufacturers because of that increasing challenges in globalization. And this time, the total quality management movement or philosophy has proliferated. These are like the evolution of total quality management from quality control, quality assurance to total quality management. Some of you or some organizations who have just recently institutionalized their ISO 9000, they may have already quality assurance offices. No, uh, in the academy, they have this already in place. In the private firms, of course, in sectors, they have quality assurance, quality control, they also have this. But overall, if you would have to look into this perspective, 
it's a total quality management no na nagboom during this time in 1970s to 1990s quality boss no so sometimes in this era it's quite confusing ayan ano ang quality control quality assurance and the new term quality management so when you say quality control you you basically look on how do you fulfill your requirements internally no so if you say that the characteristics of your product should be like this it has to be 96% compliant to customer satisfaction you know, if that's your internal requirement then you have to check is a particular process or office compliant to this requirement then it's quality control that's your internal characteristics or definition of quality and you you've set it as a standard to be followed internally quality assurance in the other hand is more on fulfilling the requirements of the organization plus the customer requirement so customer here can be the regulatory bodies or other interested parties so you look on the perspective of the internal and the external Then the word quality management came into place as defined by ISO 8402. So it includes already the policy, the planning, quality control, quality assurance, and quality improvement as part of your management strategies. So here you have to implement it all throughout the system, and it's called quality management. So these are basically some of the terms. Now, if you're going to look on the entire organization in a total perspective, this is what. Total quality management means it's a long-term global management strategy that brings together concepts of quality control, quality assurance, and quality management. So in short, you put them all together into a total system, working harmoniously. Everyone is committed from the top management all the way to the front line. Customers are aware. Customers are happy. You Now they're very satisfied and delighted with your services. And you have this culture of improvement. And are you aim for excellence? Then it's total quality management. Highlights the participation of all members. When you first institutionalize your QMS, maybe you are still asking documentations. Why do we have to do this? Do that? No. So all of these are some of the pain points that we have to go through. No, but mind you, when we installed the 9001 QMS, we get certified. It's just the beginning, because the moment that you have to run this up, the expectation is high. From other than, of course, the stakeholders. You're also your colleagues in your agencies. They're also asking, do we still have to do this? Do we still have to audit? Do we still have to document this and all that? No, they just some are just taking it for granted. Since wala namang PBB, do we still have to maintain? No, those are some of the questions. We commit. We installed this QMS for quite some time. We have to maintain them, and we have this policy in place. No, the quality policy that we have to continually improve, and we commit to provide quality and product services compliant to various requirements. If we institutionalize this already as a culture of commitment, everyone is involved, and you you view this as your principle toward your improvement for the benefits of your organization, the members and customers, and the society at large. No, because basically the community is where you are thriving, you are serving. Then it's called total quality management. Total in a sense that it's long term. You incorporate all the principles of control, assurance, and management. You have this total participation of people from top to bottom, no, including the society. Then it's called total quality management. Basically, when you define QMS, you establish the QMS, you define it, implement it, and improve. Basically, that's just one component. But having you, everyone around, voluntarily doing his or her own task, and you have this movement to commit to and the, the passion to to you to help your organization to improve, then that's called total quality. Management. We have these uh, popular gurus. No? Prior to the uh, introduction of ISO 9001, these are the philosophers and the experts in quality management, whom most of the tools that we're using have been derived with. So, first one is Sir William Deming. So, William Deming he proposed the PDCA cycle. No? Um, he established the American Society for Quality Control, which during that time Deming was not really recognized by the Americans. So, he has to move to Japan and installed. Quality management in that country. So that time, you, we've known Japan to be a producer of quality products and services. And he uh, initiated, you know, he, he's the first person to introduce the TQM principles. And he is also known as the father of total quality management, or simply quality management. Joseph Giron. He introduced the importance of strategic planning. When you say quality management, you have to go through strategic planning. Planning there should be control and there should be improvement, and he called it as the trilogy or quality trilogy or Giron trilogy. Then we have Philip Crosby. He described that quality is free, so everyone can define quality, and he also postulated the absolutes of quality. 
Sorry, later on, I'll show you some slides. And also propose the quality maturity grade, which is an inspiration for ISO 9004. Another one is Armand Fagenbaum. He introduced the three steps to quality through leadership, modern technology, organizational commitment, and quality 2000 framework. And the last but not the least is Haro Ishikawa. So I think everyone is aware with the Ishikawa chart now. He introduced a visual tools and statistical techniques on how do we control quality. Sa kanya nag-start yung quality circle, the Ishikawa diagram, of course, and total quality control. So these are the TQM gurus that have initiated the total quality movement. So just a recap about the Deming's point. So these are the principles that William Deming has introduced for the first time as the foundation of TQM. Top management should create a constancy of purpose so that we have to improve our product and services. So everyone should be driven in the same philosophy, same strategic direction. And you always have to adopt new philosophy. We have to be open for changes. We have to cease dependence on mass inspection. So we have to create our own and define our own standards if possible. And practice of awarding business and price tag alone. So we have to go beyond profits or profit maximization. We have to look on also the customer welfare. We also look on the employee welfare. Constancy and forever improve the system of production and service. So the concept of continual improvement has been emphasized on the fifth point. Institute modern methods of training on the job. So you have to come up with certain technologies you know, on how you're able to train people and ensure their competencies. Institute modern methods of supervising. So new tools to supervise. We have to invest on new cutting-edge technologies. AI, artificial intelligence, driven, and other cutting-edge technologies that can help us with our monitoring. We have to drive out fear. If possible, we have to remove these policies that are detrimental to human resources resources, unfair practices, because if a person is fearing for something else, uh, it may affect his performance at that point. Break down barriers. So barriers, whether you have a structured organizational structure, you, know, you have barriers on hierarchy. You cannot go from one to your, let's say, a frontline employee. You cannot go directly to the president. The flat versus the vertical articulations of organizations, they create barriers at some point. So according to him, if we can remove them, then it's better. Eliminate work standards and numerical quotas. Well, that was Deming during his time, no? And medyo hindi siya aligned sa standards. He doesn't want to restrict us to define our quality. So that's total quality management. No? So you see, total quality management is more on flexibility and are adaptable rather than quality management system. They are more into standards and we set the minimum. No? So you, you would see now the at least the, the difference between the two. TQM and QMS. QMS are more than standards. You set the basic, you set the requirement. If you don't meet the requirement, it's a nonconformity. Deming's point on TQM, it's more on flexibility, that you can create your own standard. You can create your own characteristics of quality. And from there, you have to keep on improving and you have to motivate people. So it's more on the positive side, uh, on motivating people. You have to institute vigorous programs on education and training. So they believe that people resources are limitless, so they have to invest well in education and training. And top management should structure that pushes the 12 points. It's more about the top management efforts, no? So, uh, which is synonymous pa rin naman sa ating QMS principles. And make transformation everyone's job. So it's the responsibility of the top management to institutionalize reforms, policies that will transform the job of everyone. Of course, part of there is they're motivating them through incentives or maybe development programs. Unfortunately, there are mga deadly diseases that according to Deming are detrimental to any organization and may limit them from improving no, and institutionalizing TQM. The lack of constancy of purpose. So if, it's, if your purpose is not consistent and um, you, you tend to rely at some point and you're not open for innovation you know it's a disease that you have to overcome your short-term profits no you don't look on your business or your organization as into profit no you have to go beyond that you have to look on satisfying your customers so that they return back to you and you know continue patronizing your product and evaluate the performance merit rating and annual review so all of these are quite heavy for employees so this should be removed as much as possible the mobility of the top management they have to be very hands-on a running company on visible diagrams alone, so money, data, is not sufficient, or you have to go beyond profit. And the medical costs and costs of liability as much as possible, you have to trim them down because they are detrimental for the organization. The popular framework of Deming is, of course, the PDCA cycle, also known as the Deming cycle. So we, this one has been adopted by ISO 9001. As a manager, you know, whenever we manage a certain process or an office, we have to plan, plan ahead. There should be a strategic plan, organizational plan, strategic project plan, action plan. Whenever you execute, you do it. You should have procedures, work instructions, guidelines. And then when you execute, and then you have to check, you know, check if you have met your target, you have met your plan. So that's checking. You can do audits, you can do management reviews, you can do a random inspection. Then later on, whatever you have found that is non-conformity, it's failure, there is an issue that you or there's a system breakdown, you need to act, no? You need to solve that problem 
you need to take corrections and corrective actions and document and do not do the same mistake over again. So that's the PDCA cycle. So Ram has came up with the quality trilogy, wherein he proposed that quality should start with planning. Then when you execute, there should be control and then you improve. So that's his trilogy. This trilogy should work in parallel with budgeting. So the moment that you execute certain uh, quality planning, quality control, quality improvement, they should go hand in hand with your budgeting your cost control and cost reduction. Because the premise here is that you have to maximize your profits. Same thing, no? In the government sector, whenever you propose certain uh, changes in your organization, no? You need to plan ahead and you look for, do you have budget? If you don't have budget, then you need to cut some unnecessary expenses. You have to find ways on how to be able to augment your resources so that you can invest in certain improvement. So that's according to Juran Quality Trilogy. That whenever you do plan, you control, you improve in respect to quality, you have to look on the financial perspective as well. He also introduced the breakthrough sequence. So the keywords here is that we have to have breakthrough attitudes, your mindset to innovate. You identify vital few projects. You have to invest on few projects, but they have to be breakthrough, something that you will benefit later on. You have to seek breakthrough knowledge. You conduct analysis, no? overcome changes, resistance in changes. You institute the change, and then you have to institute control. So it's more on about going beyond the comfort zone and look for where you can institutionalize improvement for the organization. Crosby, on the other hand, our third philosopher, he introduced the quality of uh, absolutes. So according to him, a Quality means conformance requirements, which is adopted by ISO 9001 and other management systems. Problems are functional in nature. So basically, problems are hindi sila nag-occur kung maayos siyang ginawa. There's an implication for a requirement for documentation into that effect. And of course, awareness and training for employees. There's no optimum level of defects. So meaning, if you don't control it right away, then it can go over and over. So it's important that you do root cause analysis and implement correction and corrective action. So those are the implications on ISO 9000 and management systems that we have based on Crosby's absolutes of quality. So cost of quality is the only useful measurement. So this one is the perspectives of the private sector on profit maximization. Anything that's costly, as much as possible, don't go into that. And zero defect is the only performance of standards. So this one is perfect. They define absolute quality if you have zero defect. This is the foundation of Six Sigma, zero defect as much as possible. Crosby is also known for the QM maturity grid, wherein he defined that the level of quality of a certain organization can be categorized in different stages. Stage 1, uncertainty. Stage 2, awakening. Stage 3, enlightenment. Stage 4, wisdom. Stage 5 is certainty based on different criteria. So this one is almost synonymous with ISO 9004, wherein when you institutionalize a quality management, you have to assess what is the maturity level in terms of awareness, in terms of culture, in terms of top management support, in terms of innovation implemented? So, tinitig na sa QM maturity grade. Feigenbaum proposed the three steps to quality. He defined that quality leadership is an important element in an organization. It has to focus on planning. Then modern quality technology, we have to invest in this because they will revolutionize the work. And there should be organizational commitment. And we have this culture of continual improvement and motivation for us to do these changes or improvement for organization. Then Ishikawa, you know, is a very familiar quality management uh, philosopher. He introduced the total quality control. So here, here are some of his proposals. You know, improve corporate health and company character by having a good image to the community in least all employee participation so we have to encourage them to get involved we have to establish quality assurance and obtain customer confidence get customer feedback as much as possible aspire for high quality and develop new product management so you you open for innovation establish management system that secures profit in times of slow growth so you always look on for ways on how would you able to gain in terms of monetary and profit value show respect for human nature you know? so this one is a very prevalent Japanese philosophy. You have to respect the nature so that nature will respect you as well. Human resources as well. Provide cheerful workplace because they believe in karma and they believe in good karma. You have to utilize quality controls, different techniques and processes in for you to be able to control like monitoring, measurement, analysis, verification, feedback, data information, corrective action, preventive action, improvement, innovation, some of the key processes in terms of quality control. I think everyone is familiar with the Ishikawa diagram. You use this in your root cause analysis. You define the problem and understanding the causes of the problem or the root causes can be identified in terms of manpower, materials, machines, modern nature, measurement methods. That's the Ishikawa diagram, also known as the fishbone diagram, cause and effect diagram, CE model, what have you. That's the Ishikawa diagram, one of the best tools introduced by Ishikawa. TQM, no? total quality management. Somehow you might be asking what's the difference with the ISO 9001. 
as I mentioned earlier, PQM constitute quality control, quality planning, quality assurance, quality policy, quality improvement, and quality management into a total system wherein everyone is involved. So the first principle, which is similar to ISO 9001 QMS, your familiar customer focus. So as I mentioned earlier, our customer is the ultimate judge of quality. So if they say if they're not satisfied, then we don't have a quality service. Organizations should understand the needs and expectations of customers. You're familiar with this. You have to strive efforts to attain customer delight. So take note, delight. No, you have to make them happy. You have to make them smile, not just satisfied, but they have to be overjoyed and they have to give you positive feedback or good word of mouth for other people for you to be recognized. Another principle is process approach. This one is common also in ISO 9001 in QMS. So here we need to view the interaction of our processes, our offices, our divisions, our sectors, our units, that we need to define what are the sources, what are the inputs, what are the plan activities, outputs, customers. In here, we look at the totality of the system and we have to make sure that whenever we institutionalize changes in a process, they don't affect another process. With that, we have to be very careful. We need to document as much as possible so that we avoid non-conformities or issues in the future. Another principle consistent with quality management systems, effective leadership. So here, top, middle, supervisory management should lead by doing. So everyone who's leading, they have to be hands-on. They should establish unity of purpose, open communication, and clear organizational vision. So it's important. You know, in total quality management, everyone is involved. Hindi lang si top management is responsible, but everyone, middle and supervisory, and including the frontliners, they have to be involved. Everyone should be uh, intrinsically motivated to share, right? All employees and suppliers should be involved as key partners through collaboration, competency development activity. I think everyone is uh, familiar with the social cognitive theory of Bandura, where the more you give positive reinforcement, then the more motivated are the employees. So same goes with our suppliers, right? If we have a positive communication with each other, then we can establish total quality management system. Empowered employees and stakeholders can make a difference. People are like the best resources that we have. They could make your system down or your organization down. They could also make it successful. Another principle, which is also consistent with quality management, informed decision making. So here, if you belong to, you know, if you're an official, you know, you make decisions, you have to make sure that it's based on facts. It has to be based on information that's reliable. And it has to be based on scientific reasoning. Now, it has to go through scientific process. If you go through research and you would like to validate, then much better. Data should be carefully analyze and here it's important that you need to use quality tools later on i'll show you some of the quality tools results should be communicated effectively now meaning you need to be transparent the same time objective with the way that you communicate the results to the top management to the concerned officials or employees and the last but not the least which is also consistent with the quality management principles continual improvement so every stakeholder from top management to frontline should commit to do better always now they commit to improve and foster innovation so in short, TQM principles are synonymous with quality management principles. They have the same foundation. No? Although the ISO 9001 with the latest revision in 2015, there's now the risk-based thinking. No? The risk-based thinking, basically, if you will reflect in the TQM principle, it goes through with the informed decision-making, wherein you have to consider all this data you know, during your planning, you know, different phases, planning, doing, checking, and acting as part of your decisions. You need to establish the data and evidence. So what are these TQM tools? No, TQM tools are widespread. We use them in day-to-day -day operations, but maybe we're not so familiar with as TQM tools. So one is the cause and effect diagram. No, the Ishikawa chart, the fishbone diagram, I mentioned that earlier, check sheet, control chart, histogram, Pareto chart, scatter diagram, flow chart. These are the common TQM tools that we've been using for quite some time. So cause and effect diagram, you no know, diagram from ASQ. Now we use this to identify the root causes for a certain problem. You now I think majority of you are using this in your root cause analysis when you're implementing your corrective action procedure for your QMS. Now here you identify the problem and then what are these different issues that are here? You no, know, ito yung mga bones, major bones, and the sub bones are basically the minor root causes of the problem. So I think everyone's familiar with this one, cause and effect diagram, Ishikawa chart, fishbone diagram, they're the same. Sample check sheet. No, we use this to tabulate how many nonconformities or just use it to like document what's the frequency for a particular object that you're trying to monitor. We use this, let's say, for election, no, can account nothing. Or maybe you would like to check how many nonconformities are found in particular audit. No, you could use that to document the number of occurrences or frequencies by using check or crossing them out. So this one is a very familiar tool. 
for everyone. Sample control chart. So this control chart, basically you use this, let's say show relationship, no? how consistent the data is. So if you see that it's fluctuating, then it means it's not flexible or it's maybe consistent. No? If you see that the data are like are looking into a certain maximum and certain minimum limit. So if it's consistent, then you could say that the system is consistent. No? But it's fluctuating, then maybe you would say that it's not performing well, no? something like that. So this control chart can tell you, uh, can give you decision making. Like it's whether it's above or below a certain target. Another one is histogram. So we use this a lot of times, no, to document like how many times a certain error has occurred, no, or a certain uh, defect has occurred, no. So in this particular case, this one has appeared twice. It's particular na defect na to. This particular product has occurred twice. This in 15 times, four, and all that. So you would see here the histogram of certain errors that have occurred for a certain period of time. Sample Pareto chart. So, so uh, if histogram is more on looking at the general perspectives of the errors, Pareto chart will group them into ascending order or descending order. Almost similar, no? You just have to look at here as uh, the descending perspective presentation of, let's say, the errors. Almost similar with histogram. Sample flow chart. We use this on how do we document our procedures. We do procedures because we have to make sure that everyone is informed to do his task. If I have a new employee, new colleague, then he or she is guided, no? So this flow chart are very basically symbols on how do you do planned activities. So this one is a top-level perspective of a certain flowchart. No, you, you use certain boxes, uh, also known as block diagram. And here is the more detailed flowchart. You use a certain uh, terminal to say it's start or maybe it's end. You have this process. No, rectangle means a process. The steps are here. What are the planned activities? Then you go through a decision making, which is a diamond. So if it's false, then you go somewhere here. You could loop. If it's yes, then you could proceed or true. You could proceed another process and all that. No, so basically that's an example of flowchart, which one of the quality tools. Another one is scatter diagram. So basically, you show relationship here of X and Y, for example, and then you plot them. No, and then later on, you could do some grouping. You could make some analysis here. No, if a certain data is above or below a certain target. So here you could see that they are scattered together. We use this in our decision making, statistical context of clustering, no, or classification. You could use this in regression analysis and other estimates in statistics. Whenever we implement PQM, it's basically similar with the way that we implement on our QMS. But it's, this one is more on totality and not so more into standards, but it's more on flexibility and adaptability. So of course here, you need to prepare. So what are the opportunities that you have ahead? What are the visions that you would like to accomplish? What are your five-year plan? You have three-year plan, one-year plan. What are your goals? If you have quality policy, which is good, no, you could easily prepare it. Then later on, you go through with the planning. So here you identify a certain in charge. No, what is the plan? Do you have the right resources? Do you have enough resources? Are you open for changes? What are the changes to be done? So you have to document all this. Then later on, you assess how was the implementation of your total quality management system. Uh, maybe you could conduct your surveys, evaluation questionnaires, or interviews. No, you ask your customers, you ask your stakeholders, and all that. No, you could look into that perspective. And you go through with the implementation, quality practices. No, you have to check. You have to go through, uh, implement uh, the process improvement teams. You have to identify them. And later on, you need to diversify your TQM into a system-wide innovation through innovation, through improvement strategies. You can do some benchmarking here. You can have your own control in such a way that you implement and uh, improve your 2QM in the long run. Now, you might be asking, what is this TQM? What is the difference with TQM and ISO 9000, Six Sigma? And yesterday, you learned about lean manufacturing. Okay, so let's talk about them. We know ISO 9000, we implemented this a few years ago. You've been certified. You get certified certified what's next okay, maybe you'll be asking that question right i also have that same question when i was still starting up with qms you spend a lot of money for this preparation and all that so basically iso 9001 is just the beginning it's the total picture yeah just a review it's series it's a basically series of standards or set of standards family of standards that we use to ensure that we meet customer and other stakeholder needs with statutory and regulatory requirements related to a product or service through a quality management system. So take note, if before, the evolution of TQM was based on quality control, quality assurance, then quality management, and then total quality management, here, you look at as a system. So you group different processes, different offices, divisions together as one system that is called QMS. But the total quality management, it's basically QMS is part of the TQM, and you look at the whole perspective if everyone is doing it, then that's total quality management. And the emphasis here in ISO 9000 is more on conformance. No? You need to meet the requirements of statutory and regulatory requirements, which is in the explicitly defined by TQM. So TQM is more on flexibility. No? You need to establish your internal definition of quality. 
that it doesn't also mean that if it's TQM, you didn't need to conform with regulatory statutory body. What TQM is proposing is that you have to be flexible. Now, meaning you can adopt your own philosophy of quality management in that effect. But it's on ISO 9000, it's more on compliance, more on conformance. So there is a requirement to be audited internally and to be audited externally to establish that you are a conformity or at par with the world standards. So ISO 9001 has the ISO 9000 2015 fundamentals and vocabulary. I know you're quite familiar with this. The definitions are there. 9001 2015, which you use it to establish your QMS. No, This is the standard being used by auditors whenever they check your conformance to the standard. ISO 9002 2016, so it's guidelines on how do you implement the ISO 9001 2015. I'm not sure if any one of you has used this one, but there is a guideline that guides you on how do you establish and implement a QMS, ISO 9002 2016. And the ISO 9000 2018, which is quite replicated with the maturity model, 9000 for 2018 will uh, assess what is the level of maturity of your QMS after a year of, let's say, establishing it, maybe the second year, the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year. Yeah, I think some of you have already completed the cycle and maybe you could use ISO 9000 for into that effect. One of the highlights of the QMS are the seven principles, which I've mentioned earlier, which is synonymous with TQM. So basically they have the same, but on the ISO 9001, they have the introduction of the risk-based thinking. So the evidence-based decision-making here, they highlighted here the risk-based thinking to that effect. So at least you consider the risks, the opportunities whenever you decide or whenever you do the planning. Six Sigma, you heard this if you are in the, in the manufacturing industry, the private sectors. You heard about Six Sigma, green belts, black belts, and all that, right? So basically, it's a process improvement tool, which you aim to produce products with 99.99966% free of defects or that's 3.4 defects in 1 million output. So if you're expected to produce 1 million piece of, let's say, alcohol, 3.4 lang for that 1 million total ay acceptable level of defect or nonconformity. So it's a very precise improvement tool. It's very widely used in the private industry, manufacturing industry. You know? They have this methodology called DMI. No, that's define. You define what's your charter. Maybe you use a SIPOC here, um, sup, uh, supplier input, uh, plant activities, output, and the customer. No, I think you've done that in your QMS. You measure, no, you use process map, or maybe the different quality tools that I just mentioned scatter graph, Pareto, histogram, etc. Then you analyze using root cause analysis, or maybe FMEA, no, using risk based thinking tools. Okay. Then you keep on improving, maybe through experiments, maybe you use the Kaizen methodology, Kaizen principle, or maybe prototyping approach, you could use that. Then you control, if you have control plan, no? if you have 5S in place or statistical process control, these are some of the tools that you can use to implement DMI or DMAIC, right? which is the methodology of Six Sigma. And mind you, uh, ISO has uh, crafted or implemented the ISO 13053-2011. Here, the DMIC has been standardized, uh, which serves as guide to organizations in, in implementing Six Sigma. Then the lean manufacturing, which you just discussed yesterday. Basically, a lean manufacturing here is like you produce uh, less waste, wastage, or maybe non-value adding activities, whether in terms of time, in terms of cost, or maybe waste from suppliers to customers. And you would like to enhance that customer experience by getting rid of all these non-value added activities or elements of your production. In manufacturing, more fitting into the uh, private sector, but of course it can be adopted in the government sector. No? This is based on the Toyota production system or just in time, or in the use of certain raw materials are just in time or just based on the need of based on their specifications. No? They don't need to buy a lot of inputs or supplies because it's just a waste. So proponents here were John Kraft Sick, he coined the term lean, no, and James Warmup and Daniel Jones. They define the five key principles of lean manufacturing, meaning you precisely specify the value of specific products. So you have to be very specific. How do you define a quality? If it's 99.9996% accuracy, then so be it. Identify the value stream for each product. Make value without uh, interruptions. And let customer pull value from producer and pursue perfection. So lean manufacturing, again, they are more into reducing waste and being more precise. And uh, they are very useful in inventories and the manufacturing perspectives, of course, can also be used in the government sector if you are more focused on minimizing waste in a quantitative perspective. So you would be asking, okay, so we talk about these differences. So similarities now with TQM, with QMS, ISO 9000, 
with Six Sigma and Lean Manufacturing, one is they all talk about improvement. So here you have to focus continuous improvement. This is their main agenda. How they work on with their customers, whether customers are viewed as their primary customers or secondary customers. No? At the end of the day, they all wanted to improve. Government perspective is how do you improve the service so that you will get awarded or maybe you get incentives later on because you hit the PBB or you hit whatever metrics that you have in your quality objectives, IPCR, OPCR. You get promoted because of good performance. No? But in the private sector, of course, it's a different story. The more you produce quality product, you have to improve this so that you make profit and later on you get promoted as well. You get some visual incentives and all that. So all of this boils down onto that commitment for improvement. Second is process approach. No? So you have to view the system as interrelationships of one process over the other as just a standalone system. So, so one system, that one process will affect the other. With that, during planning, you have to be very careful in defining your inputs, your plan activities, your outputs, what are the metrics or criteria to measure the performance and all that. No? So you need to use various tools, quality tools in that effect. All of this, Six Sigma, PQM, ISO 9001, and Lean, they propose the use of quality tools so that you can come up with verifiable, valid, and accurate data and analysis results. So these are two similarities of PQM with the other improvement tools that I've mentioned. And you come to realize that PQM is limitless, it's overarching. So quality is everyone's business in PQM. Here, being a top management or a member of the middle management supervisor, you need to leverage opportunities on how do you improve the culture of excellence, quality and excellence. In your own definition, whether you would like to comply with regulatory, statutory standard, or you just have to institutionalize a culture of, you know, being happy employee and satisfying your customers to be happy. You t the totality of producing quality management is there. You now everyone's business. So here you use multiple improvement tools, techniques, then you keep on innovating. So that's the keyword on TQM. So TQM, some philosophers, they say it's the umbrella of all these improvement tools, whether it's ISO 9001, Six Sigma, Lean, Quality Tools, Benchmarking, Standards, 5S, internal policies that you have actually is also a quality management effort. No, Your guidelines and policies that you have crafted, they aim to improve your performance or your value for your customers. And other quality techniques altogether, they put them into one umbrella that's TQM. All right, next up, we talk about business excellence. So I would like to adopt this phrase from Vince Lombardi. He mentioned that the quality of a person's life is direct proportion to his commitment to excellence. So I think we agree with this one. Whatever definitions that we adopt, what's quality with you? At the end of the day, it's all about improvement. And once we have reached the optimum potential or the peak of that improvement, then that's the time that we can define that we are already excellent on our own means and definitions. Going back with the productivity goal no, in the public sector, so one of the provisions of the Philippine Development Plans, we have to provide seamless service delivery. Corruption has to, should be reduced. Administrative governance should be enhanced. We have to be citizen-centered, no, engaged and empowered. And the civil service is strengthened. All the way up, we would able to lay down the foundation of inclusive growth and high trust and resilient society in globally competitive knowledge and economy. A credit to the Duterte administration and, of course, uh, the NEDA who spearheaded the development plan. These are basically the challenges and the needs no, in the government sector that we're able to overcome. So in the government efforts, we heard about the Productivity Incentives Act in 1990, where we give certain productivity incentives, whether you're into the private sector or into the public sector. It was spearheaded by DOLE and the Department of Finance. So this one's still in effect. We have heard about the RA 9485 or Anti-Red Tape Act. Well, we define here our Citizens Charter, our public officers of the day. You have these feedback mechanisms and all that. Then eventually it was revive into RA 11032 no? or the Anti-Red Tape Act or the Ease of Doing Business, I should say, which has replaced the Anti-Red Tape Act. But uh, the authority is now called the ARTA Authority under the Office of the President. So here we promote efficient and timely delivery, no? regardless of agency we belong to. No? We have to provide efficient and timely services. Then in 2001, no, the Philippine Quality Award Act of 2001 has been introduced. So this one is spearheaded by DTI. Later on, I'll give you some examples into that. No? And then we also have the institutionalization of the Government Quality Management Program. So we have the GQMP. And uh, right now, it's spearheaded by 
DDM and through DAP, we have the GMC. We have the based on EO605, tiers of 2007. So we provide technical assistance to select government agencies to come up with their own ISO 9001 efforts no, for free. Some, they go through with a memorandum of agreement with TAP to provide specialized services in establishing, maintaining, and improving your quality management systems. So we provide these activities no, for the public through DAP. You know, with you, I think majority of you already are ISO certified. The main output of the EO605-2007, we institutionalized QMS in the government sector. And the efforts on improving the performance of our employees, we have heard this, no? Sometimes it's taken for granted, but, you know, it's still reality that we have to improve our productivity and performance in the government service. CSC, Memorandum Circular 6 of 2012, we need to come up with our strategic performance management system. We hear it a lot of times, no, the IPCR, the OPCR, without the, the PBB, but it's not. We have to perform well still, fill up this IPCR and OPCR and deliver what is expected from us to our respective organizations. Now, the TQM has been evolved into something that's more pressing nowadays. Some are calling it the TQM has transformed into business excellence because TQM is like the totality of the quality efforts that you have, controlling, planning, uh, quality assurance, improvement, and you, you aim to come up with a total quality culture. You now everyone is involved, then it has evolved into a new dimension called business excellence or in, the, in our government sector, then government excellence. So it's a philosophy that aims to develop and strengthen the management systems of an organization to achieve excellent performance and create value for stakeholders. So the keyword here is excellent. So how do you define excellent? Of course, you have reached already that fulfillment of quality. You institutionalize improvement efforts and you think that you have reached already this kind of maturity that you are worth emulating by your colleagues or your peer organizations and you are worthy to be recognized as one of the best in the country or in the world, then it's considered business excellence culture. So it's an approach no, that has evolved from TQM in which the culture of excellence is embedded in the core facets of an organization. So meaning in your core values, excellence is one of those that have been explicitly defined. Everyone is committed to be excellent, not to excel on his or her own field. I hope one day we will be able to look into your core values and we see the word excellence not as part of your core values. And I think majority of you also have this already in place. So business excellence are basically your internal commitment to keep on improving, to institutionalize quality, keep on improving, and later on fulfill that extent of excellence. Of course, there are different models and frameworks being used. The BE models are also known as the TQM models. Now, these are like the new generation of TQM models. They are frameworks used as reference in understanding and evaluating the level of business excellence or government agency excellence maturity in an organization. So basically, there are two major business excellence models. No? One is the very popular, the Malcolm Baldrige National Performance Excellence in the U.S. No? This has been adopted in the Philippines and other countries, no? much more in the Asian region. And the uh, other one is the European Foundation for Quality Management Excellence Model, more into the European countries and into the Middle East. No? Uh, for the context of our discussion, we will focus on the Malcolm Baldrige later on. This is excellent frameworks basically have been defined by MAN 2016. No? These are frameworks that will guide us to make the right interventions and techniques and produce excellent results. This is a sample illustration of the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award Framework. No? So here, basically, these are the elements. So it looks like it's almost similar with the QMS. No? So in the QMS, you talk about customer, the PDCA cycle here the 10 causes, and then you have your core, your support, and your management processes, and you have your output, and you have your control mechanism. So basically, that follows the process approach. In the MBN QA framework, basically, the core criteria here includes the leadership, still the top management, the strategic planning, no? which is part of EQM planning. Next is customer focus. No? Of course, you're still part of the principles. Then you have to have your methods on measurement, analysis and knowledge management. So you can still look this at QMS. Workforce focus, no, because we believe that employees are limitless, no, the potential employees are limitless. You have to focus also on the operation, no, how do you control the operational processes? It's important. And you have, how do you manage the results? How do you control them? How do you improve them? So it's also important. So all of these make up the ecosystem of the organization and consideration of the environment, the relationships with other 
government agencies or the communities and your strategic situation and your potentials. So that is the MBNQA framework. So the MBNQA framework basically highlights the need for you to understand the inputs. No? So these inputs basically in the context of leadership, the customer focus, the employee focus, the planning, etc. No? And come up with your own respective output or the results. No? So input, output. So synonymous pa rin siya, right? quality management system. Now in this case, what matters here is you would able to translate the inputs into meaningful output based on your mandate or based on your commitment for excellence. So in the Philippines, we have the Philippine Quality Award. So this one is a very prestigious award given into any organization, whether you belong to the private or to the public sector. So it's a global competitiveness template, according to DTI, that aims to encourage and engage public and private organizations and other stakeholders to strive and attain performance excellence. It's the highest level of award that can be given to any organization, according to EO448, Series of 1997, RA9013 of 2001. So it's based in the Malcolm Badridge National Quality Award of the USA. So basically, it uses the same framework. No? The objectives are the following. So it will look on how would you able to stimulate improvements in your quality, productivity, and competitiveness. So if you have established a quality management system, you've been practicing TQM no, for quite some time, you've been using these quality tools, You are you implementing Six Sigma or Lean Management or Lean Manufacturing no, as part of your principles, then they will add value later on to your TQA initiatives. Of course, it also aims to assess we're able to establish the guidelines and criteria to become an excellent organization. No? They have to look into this perspective. Then later on, another objective is we have to recognize. We have to give award for those who are deserving, who have met the criteria, no? and recognize them as the best excellent organizations in the country. And another objective of why we have to go through with this one is because we need to benchmark. We need to share the best practices. Now, from one organization to the other, we learn the best methods, the best strategies on how to manage a particular organization, no? to be at par with the world's best no? in their respective industries. That is another objective of the PQA. So the PQA framework, which I've shown you earlier, is almost synonymous, similar with the Malcolm Baldrige. No? So you have the leadership, you have the strategy, you have the customers, and you see here that they're grouped into triad, meaning they have to be managed in clusters. Same goes with workforce operations and results, no? Then you have measure, analyze, and improve your knowledge management, no? Your internal organizational knowledge, whether in the form of research, patents, no? The trainings, the competencies, the best practices, the learnings, and the failures that you have documented, it's important that you have to manage them. So, and then you have to make sure that your commitment for excellence, no? Hindi lang quality and improvement, but it's on excellence is embedded on the core value of everyone. So, Everyone is, uh, you know, committed to drive for excellence. So basically, this framework that I have mentioned earlier, when you go through the PQA award, you will be assessed on this particular criteria. No? So how do we define leadership? So almost similar with the definition of QMS, TQM, what were the efforts and actions of the senior leaders or the top management on guiding or sustaining your organization based on your mandate, your visions, your goals. Governance system would also be looked at. No? What are your compliance to legal, ethical, and societal responsibilities? So here, these are the perspectives that we'll be looked at. Another one is the strategy. So how would you be able to develop certain plans, whether strategic plans, action plans, no? or the objectives, and in meeting up your mandates in the society. The extent of implementation of plans will also be checked. And the management of changes. Do you document them? Do you learn from your best practices and the failures and all that? Another category is customer. No? So almost a similar perspective with QMS. You engage customers for long-term market success. So they have to look on what are the strategies or methods that you have implemented to engage them as part of your continual improvement process. Effective communication to customers and building long-lasting relationships. So take note that this is TQM in Notion or an improved version of TQM. So that total involvement of people, your customers, your suppliers should be there. No? So there should seamless cooperation and teamwork, collaboration with one another. Then measurement, analysis, and knowledge management, it should still be there. No? You will be evaluated on how do you select. You gather, analyze, learning, managing, improving data, and the use of technology. No? How do you review findings and improve performance? So basically, if you have the QMS in place, corrective action procedure, then you are most likely compliant with this one. You just have to add some more to make it more value-adding and get additional points in your awards. 
workforce also, no, it will be checked on how do you assess your workforce capability and capacity needs. Do you conduct training needs analysis, training effectiveness? Now, what are the results? Are everyone empowered? Are they competent no, in that effect? So empowerment of employees to realize their food potentials and align with organizational needs will be checked as well. Operations. No? In operations, you will also be assessed on the extent of designing, managing, and improving your products and work processes to ensure that operational effectiveness and organizational sustainability is accomplished or realized. So it's almost similar with the way that we got audited with external providers or external auditors. No? In ISO 9001 efforts, you will be checked if the procedures that you document are actually being implemented, are customers being satisfied, no? to check nila yan. And the results, no? The results are all performance and improvements in areas uh, in terms of product, processes, customers, workforce, leadership, financial market. Are they satisfactory? No? Were they able to meet the required targets? Performance level against competitors? How do you fare well in the competition? No? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? They have to look into that. So this is a sample scoring system for the PQA for everyone's awareness. No? There are seven categories in leadership it's 120 points strategy 85 points customer 85 measurement analysis 90 workforce 85 strategy 85 customer is 45 so overall it's 1000 points so what matters here in the scoring system now they have to look on your strengths and weaknesses depending on that category and then they will lay down into a report for your consumption later on the PQA has six sets of criteria. One is a generic criteria, other industries that are not defined here. Then another one is if you belong to a government uh, agency. So this was the criteria they'll be using. You know? that, the most recent one is 2017 to 2021. If you're into the healthcare, whether you're public or private entity, you know, this is the criteria. Another one is if you belong to the construction, most likely this is the private sector, education sector, you know, uh, or education criteria for the education, uh, SUCs or HAIs or basic education no? smes no if you if you are into the small uh, medium enterprises so who are eligible as I mentioned earlier this is open to all organizations whether it belongs to the public sector like national government agencies lgus sucs government financial institutions gocc's etc as long as you belong to the government sector then you are eligible as well as with the private sector no whether you belong to the agriculture the manufacturing services construction and others okay Timeline, usually this is the application timeline according to the website of PQA. You just submit your requirements or eligibility by March. You check you know, if you're eligible. So that's one, you'll get results. In May, you will, if, you, if they say yes, then you will submit the application and related documents on May. There will be independent review on June to July. Then there's a consensus review of those who have evaluated. They will let you know if there will be a state visit, which will be conducted in September. In October, there will be final judges review. And PQA awarding ceremony is sometime in February the following year. All right, so what are the awards and recognitions? Basically, there are four levels based on the points and the recommendations of the experts. No, uh, They can award you for commitment. No, Your commitment, level one, you have this commitment, no? a serious commitment to improve quality excellence. So that's the first level. The second level is that they will check if you are proficient, no? if you have significant progress in building sound processes. The third one is you have the mastery level. So this is the third level of award. No? You have superior results uh, that are linked to robust management system. And uh, of course, the highest level is the, if you were able to meet no, the, the requirements of the PQA, business excellence framework, then you will be awarded with a PQA for performance excellence. So meaning there's a management excellence no, and you have to improve and build outstanding results and excellent system. So it's worth emulating uh, not just with the private, the, the, pub, the public, but also in the private sector. So since as of 2018, these are some of the organizations who have been awarded you know, with level one recognition and commitment. So for private organizations, there are 30, and some of them are Mindanao Corrugated, University of Mindanao, you know, Southville International School and Colleges, and also Litran. So congratulations for them. And public organizations is 20. So that would include uh, Tanawan, TUST, TESDA, TOLE, no? and UP, Engineering Center. Second level, uh, meaning that they have the proficiency and quality management. There are 22 private organizations as of 2018. Lycee of the Philippines, Batangas, Holy Angel University, Thompson Reuters, Reed Elsevier Philippines. Public organizations, we have five, TUST, 
uh, the US Region 9, Land Bank, and National Kidney. Next is level three. No, so level three, it means that you have the mastery in quality management. Five private organizations so far have been awarded since 2018. So that includes the NYX, Shipment Incorporated, Panasonic, Intel, IMI. No, uh, in the public sector, there's one, the Philippine Heart Center. And the highest of all, no, the loan PQA awardee as of 2018. No, they, they are, it's, it's Unilab. So it's a private uh, organization no, into pharmaceutical products so they received their pqa for performance excellence in 2008 so so far we only have pqa award so why do we have to go through with this business excellence activity you would like to get certified later on no, evaluated through the pqa framework so the benefits are like you you get third party view so if other people or experts would count your organizations at least you could say that the practices that you have are verified or validated by other people no by the experts. So with that, you can have more confidence. So we have to do this. Otherwise, uh, we won't obtain um, business excellence. So there's detailed evaluation. No? So their evaluation, their scoring system will be there. There will be some feedback that will be stated in the report, your strengths and weaknesses. So all of this will be discussed during your closing meetings. Then recognition. No? Uh, the recognition definitely is like the consuelo no? because you've done your best. You Started a lot of efforts to institutionalize TQM and business excellence in your respective organizations. You will enjoy the recognition of one of the best in the country. And of course, it's also recognized around the world because of the Malcolm Baldrige aligned criteria. No? So they can, people will think that you are a worth emulating organization in the Philippines and also in the world. No? So you'll be recognized in that effect. And benchmarking, so this is the best part of going through with this because you benchmark with other organizations, you learn from their practices, you learn from their weaknesses as well, and you share the tools that you can use to improve your processes. So in terms of administrators, no, DTI is the main implementing agency. So any information about this, you can go through with DTI directly. Um, DAP no, is the award administration for public sector, while the Philippine Society for Quality is for the private sector. More information, you could go to pqa.dti.gov.ph. All right, so my question now is how to start the improvement in the public sector. So I laid down here a sample timeline in such a way that we just at least be aware of what you expect. No? So I know majority of you are already ISO 9001 certified, which is good. So that's an opportunity for us to improve, right? So uh, plus 10.3 or plus 10, we have to keep on improving. So Part of that is if you would like to combine your ISO 9001 with another management system, ISO 45001, or maybe you would like to use another uh, process improvement tool or techniques, lean manufacturing, Six Sigma, and use other quality tools that we just discussed. Uh, maybe later on uh, you use uh, emerging technologies, AI, what have you, no? Internet of Things. You think that all of this will be helpful and value to your organization. Go with it, put them together into a one total system. And from here, that's basically our baseline. No? Then you go ahead and brainstorm. You, know? you brainstorm, you develop the action plan, what should be done, you know? who will be responsible in all that. So this one is a very important part of your strategy. You need to plan ahead. Okay? And of course, without the, the support of the top management, it would be hard for you. So you need to buy in the full support of the top management. But you would like to go through with these PQA initiatives because, again, with those benefits that I mentioned earlier, you have to dis let them decide that, you know, the investments are worth for every penny that you will be spending. And, of course, the, the moment that you, you secure the full support of the top management, you ensure you have the sufficient resources, whether in terms of manpower, in terms of funding, you know, budget allocation, the infrastructure resources that you will use to mobilize this project, it's very important. It's important also that you study carefully the business excellence model. So in this case, the PQA criteria. So that the moment that you, maybe you could go through with some researching, you can download the criteria and all that to understand, no? what is this BA model is all about. Next is, it is also important that you have to benchmark with the best organizations. Now, if you could consult experts, much better, right? Okay, and then afterwards, you educate no? all employees, and stakeholders, no? then you launch the project, you conduct self-assessments, then you implement and document the business excellence requirements. No? It's important that you, you, you check what is the difference between the ISO 9001 QM and the business excellence model. And from there, you look on which have you not executed yet. Then later on, you monitor the progress of your plan. So if you have your plan here no, and you have implemented the requirements, you check 
Have you met the plan? Have you met the requirements of the BE model? You evaluate the performance. How many points do you think you will get? No? Then later on, if you have simulated your self-assessment, then you can go ahead and apply for the formal PQ assessment. And of course, you go through with the process. You have to pay for something no? and all that negotiate the schedule no? and arrangements and all that. Then you will be visited by the PQA assessors. And then you go through with this continual improvement again. You innovate. You, know? you invest in innovation because that's the only way that we thrive into an ever-competitive environment. We're now into the fourth industrial revolution. The challenges of the pandemic, we have to be flexible with alternative work arrangements, yet we still have to satisfy and beat the customer expectations. This is basically the timeline that we propose. No? If you are looking forward to transitioning from QMS to business excellence no? or TQM to business excellence, this is the roadmap that you can follow no? and move forward. So what can I contribute? No. So being as an employee, you might be asking this question. So, well, going back with the sworn in when we we took the promotion, we took the job, no, we sworn in to become the best version of yourself. So it's important no, at your very own, you deliver your KPIs, your key performance indicators. You have your IPCR, your OPCR, or you are aiming for promotion, then you have to deliver these targets being given to you by your immediate supervisor or by the organization you belong to. These quality objectives are essentially designed to meet the target. So if you're meeting this target, basically you are producing also quality service, not just for yourself, but for the organization as a whole, no? and ultimately to your customers. With or without PBB, we have to deliver these KPIs. Whether with or without incentives, we have to deliver these KPIs because the public is expecting a lot from us, right? Then we have to conserve as much as possible. Public funds are basically, they have to be accounted for and we are part of the process. So with that, we minimize, avoid waste as much as possible, avoid the non-value adding activities, the time, the waste, the delay, the red tape. So if there are efforts on Anti-Red Tape Act, on um, ease of doing business, we have to streamline our procedures, go ahead and participate and do your share, right? You communicate. If you have some issues, there's some concerns that you need some clarification with, you raise these questions and effectively communicate. No? Uh, although we are entitled with our own opinion, but we live in a professional environment and we deal with the public, so we have to be professional and courteous at the same time. We should know when to you know, say no, when to say yes, in a professional manner and we still keep that professionalism all throughout and we have to keep on improving ourselves no we learn take opportunities no like this time around you might be asking oh there you have iso 9001 what's next so basically this is the next steps for iso 9001 you take the opportunities to learn new knowledge and skills and at the same time get educated and unlearn the unproductive way. So there are things that we have learned before that may not be fitting anymore, so we have to unlearn them. No? It's part of the development process as a person. We have to be involved. No, So again, it takes the village to establish an excellent organization. Uh, the top management is not enough. Your supervisors are not enough. We need you as well to be part of this movement. So be involved. No, Whether there's an additional pay, additional incentive to be involved, if not, then Maybe it's just your personal fulfillment to contribute to your organization. Proactively volunteer, you know, if you can, you be a member of committee works, whatever committee that are in place, and you could share our time, your expertise, your skills, and your efforts. So that would make a difference for the organization. And keep on improving. Put into yourself that I have to have this core value of excellence, core value of quality, core value of improvement. And if I do it that way, you know, continually improve personally and professionally, you do research so if it's possible, you extend your best practices, your learnings to the community, your peer organizations, you share together what you have learned. And from there, you benefit you know, uh, out of these uh, good relationships. Then it will help you as an institution. It will help the community at large. We can make Philippines a better country. We can increase the competitiveness index of the country in the long run. So basically, these are personal contributions that are expected from us as well. So in summary, there are overarching tools and frameworks and quality. So we, we talk about this, the ISO 9001, you have quality assurance, quality control, quality PQM, you have the ISO 9001. 
you have the Six Sigma, you have the Lean Manufacturing, and many other philosophies. No, but they all talk about quality. As I mentioned earlier, quality is subjective. We have different terminologies in quality. And at the end of the day, it's more about improvement. So when you keep on improving, coming up with this mindset, then basically at the same definition of quality. Hands-on leaders and empowered people can make a difference. Anyone here who belongs to the top management, to the middle management, we have to be hands-on, right? And at the same time, we have to involve our colleagues, whether they are to the front line, no? Uh, middle management, top management, everyone should be involved because total quality management cannot be done by just the top management. Everyone should be involved. No? Business excellence, which is the next level for total quality management, it's more than just an award. No? Ladies and gentlemen, we don't just go through with the PQA award because we, we have to be recognized as the best in the country. But it's more on a journey of building a competitive nation. So this is the ultimate goal of why we have to go through with this. It's because we have to share also the best practices that we have. We collaborate, we go through consortia with our peer universities, organizations where you can share your best practices, your talents. No, It's all about sharing because at the end of the day, we don't know until when we will leave, right? So in the government sector, we have the same strategy. You go through, you go beyond the award, you share what you got and make excellence as a culture not just for your organization, but for your peers and for the community at large. And being a person, we have to be open-minded, no? Um, whether we are secured with our jobs, whether we resist for changes and all that, we have to go back to the moment that we started our jobs. We sworn in to become a better person or a better employee and deliver quality, transparent service to your stakeholders and customers. So whenever new strategies or new learnings and philosophies are introduced like this one pqm and business excellence let's absorb them and be positive be open-minded be educated be trained no i say nobody's perfect everyone will go through these development stages and keep on innovating whether you go through with research works uh, extension works and all that you know you have to go beyond what you know for now because improvement will take a long journey and after improvement then here comes the excellence Again, um, we work in the government sector. You know? We have our own role. We have duties and responsibilities. But at the end of the day, this quality, improvement, and excellence are just words, overarching words, if we don't put them into practice. So rather than us blaming the government, blaming the top management, blaming the colleagues you know, or our bosses because of inefficient or ineffective services you know, or delayed services, we ask ourselves, what have I done in myself, right? So all of these keywords, quality, improvement, and excellence basically start with you, with me, you no, know, and with everyone else because we work in the government. Our main goal is to help the, uh, the country to become a competitive nation. Later on, we look forward that Philippines is a producer of quality products and services. And this is what basically what we look forward for from the learnings of the PQM, quality management, ISO 9000, Six Sigma Lean Management, and business excellence. So with that, thank you so much for your time. So I hope I was able to share with you some of the learnings in PQM and business excellence. Good afternoon po sa ating lahat. All right. Thank you, Sir Ralph, for that very comprehensive uh, presentation. We now move on to the question and answer portion. Um, due to the limited time that we have, we will only read two questions. So we'll start with Ms. Josefina Lakay. She is asking, is quality management parallel? to performance excellence, and how can we harmonize QMS with good governance performance? Which has greater coverage and which is more advantageous in an organization, sir? So again, no, quality management, basically, it has emanated from the concepts of quality control and quality assurance, then it became quality management putting them all them together, come up with a total quality management. Now, in total quality management, uh, the principle is that you define basically what is quality in your perspective. No, In fact, Deming has said that we have to remove the barriers, standards if possible, because standards sometimes they, they restrict no? your, your potential for improvement. So in short, if you think that you have this government, I think this is an internal or maybe it's a prescribed template or management system prescribed by your maybe governing body. No? So basically, these are still conformant. So you can still adapt this, no? what, this management system 
that has been prescribed by your regulatory body as part of your total quality management principles or with the, uh, you can embed this with your ISO 9001 no see TQM TQM is like the collection of all this QMS with that government management system that your regulatory body has required you to implement no you acquire all these tools together you, you get the best practices and you learn from these mistakes and you keep on improving. You embed this culture of excellence and here comes business excellence. And then you apply for a certain award to be recognized and be validated, be recognized and essentially emulated by other government agencies. So again, your choice of what frameworks or management system still relies on you. No? So basically, they talk about the same concept. You conformance, you talk about improvement, you talk about quality, you talk about excellence. No? You may, you know, wala pong restrictions in that effect. So what are the strategies on how do you integrate them? I think it's just a matter of, of course, understanding their gaps, no? but at the end of the day, they're the same. So if you follow ISO 9001, for instance, and you would like to implement this, no? they are basically still part of your, whenever you design your process model, no? your process model, you can incorporate this, that there's a separate management system. No? as required by your regulatory bodies, which is technically yeah, internal requirements in your end, you can do that. You integrate that in your process model in your QMS, no? or you, maybe you would like to look at it in a different perspective as a performance management tool. You could write down in your quality manual that this is another management system used to evaluate your performance. So again, you can integrate them all together and we call it as a total quality management. All right. Thank you, sir. So last question from Maria Lourdes Mendoza and several other participants is also asking this, the mobility of top management as Deming's deadly disease. How do we deal with this in government when reality presents a constant change of leaders, especially when they are mostly appointed? So what is your opinion on that, sir? Yeah, I agree that mobility is a crucial yeah, disease for implementation of total quality management. In QMS perspectives, it's required in Clause 5.2 that the top management shall no, take the leadership to implement, establish, implement, and maintain a quality management system. Now, how can we use the TQM and the QMS, uh, let's say you're more familiar with ISO 9001, to address these issues on rapid change management? So maybe I could recommend that you write down a certain procedure on how do you execute plan changes no, as required by Clause 6.3 sa QMS, sabi po doon, that whenever we execute certain changes in the management system, it has to be yes. done in a planned manner. So how planned is it? So maybe you could have a certain procedure you know, and define what is the objective, what are the resources to be done. Now, example, okay, so the objective is like we're going to do restructuring. So when you do restructuring, do you have these objectives? No? What are the timeline? What are the resources to be done? Who are responsible and all that? And before you execute these changes, it has to go through top management review and they will weigh in what is, are the risks lower than the opportunities. So if the benefits would outweigh the, the risk, then you have to go through with this. So it's a matter of a top management grip on how they're able to decide on this particular improvement initiatives. Now, your question is like, how much more if these top management are there, the ones who are changing rapidly? No? So maybe one solution into that is that you could write down certain sort of policy or maybe a procedure on succession planning. You know? So maybe you could have a procedure on, let's say, if a certain official is out of the office or maybe redesignated, then someone is identified to succeed you know? in terms of, let's say, signing a certain document. Maybe you could have that kind of procedure or policy. You define a succession. Who is in charge in case there is a change in authority or change in leadership and all that. So I think those are some of the best practices that you can consider to address changes in leadership. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Ralph, for your presentation, your answers with all of the questions from the participants this afternoon. And a reminder as well to all of our participants, don't forget to accomplish your evaluation form through the link posted in the chat box. The handouts and certificates will be issued only to those who will be submitting and watching our webinar series and evaluating our episodes. So thank you again, Dr. Ralph, for sharing your expertise um, during this session. And we'll invite you again in our future webinars. On okay. behalf of the Academy, we'd like to thank everyone for watching and we hope that you learn a lot from this session. So see you again tomorrow, 2 p.m. Philippine Standard Time for our final topic, the promotion of quality and performance excellence. 
to withstand the global pandemic featuring the Philippine Heart Center, one of the PQA awardees they will be sharing tomorrow, only here at the Public Sector Productivity Webinars. Good afternoon and thank you very much. Thank you so much.